Okay, I'm going to answer the question about how to confront someone, and if what if there are some issues uh, that exist, and how to confront that. Uh, it is a very difficult thing to do, but it's something we have to do. It's uh, the biblical concept is taken from Matthew chapter 18, when Jesus said that if someone has sinned against you, that you approach that person. Uh, if that person doesn't uh, repent, uh, doesn't handle it, then you take a few more people. If, if the person still doesn't listen, then you go. The whole church can confront the person. And if that person doesn't respond, then you can regard him as a, a non-believer. That he's not following. Now, that's a general principle. But I will talk about some uh, related issue. The first is the issue, what is more important, people and issues. Now, of course, issues have to be settled. For instance, if this person is committing adultery, it has to be handled. And, but still in the process, if someone has committed adultery or some, something very serious, does it mean that we can hurt the person? Does it mean we can hurt the person? No. no. So the question is, is personal relationship or personal feelings, his dignity and the issue, which is more important? The person's dignity and respect or the issue? Dignity. Yeah, the dignity is important. Now, the same thing for like family, if you apply to family. For instance, now it happens in our culture. I don't know in your culture whether this happened or not. Sometimes when ch children uh, break something, and then some family, you know, some parents could be so angry, they beat up the person very seriously. Uh, and giving the impression that that thing that he breaks is more precious than he is. Now, if we want to help the child not to break anything more, what can we do? There are many lies in the culture, in many cultures. The lies is, if someone is wrong, you have to punish them. Uh, you have to make them feel unhappy. And some people even, they put their anger on the person when they punish. But that doesn't achieve the purpose. And uh, in the Bible, there is a, a saying that, uh, do not, uh, because I memorized it from the Chinese Bible, the point is, do not irritate your son or Provoke him to anger. Yeah, that's the wording. Provoke him to anger. That means if your son is wrong, you punish them or you teach them. It doesn't mean you provoke them to, to anger. So the point is, how can we do it? And now I first apply to children because probably it will be helpful to you too. And then apply to adults. In many families, culture is like this. Uh, when children are wrong, then they have to be punished and, uh, and to let them know it's very serious so that they will change. Now, there's one concept, but with the Bible saying, do not provoke your children. So when we punish, if we provoke the children, it's not achieving the purpose. Now the person who wrote that is Paul. Paul himself doesn't have any children. <laughs> I don't have any children too. But God can give that revelation to, to Paul. And also for myself, even though I don't have children, I have worked with youth a lot. And I find that what's more helpful is what the, the Bible, the way the Bible uses to help people. The Bible's way is to love them first. For instance, the woman caught in adultery. Jesus could have said to him, you know, you, you are no use, you, you should be punished. You, you know, you shame on yourself, you know, he could have said something like that, but he did not. Instead, he, now, he protect her. At the same time, he point out the sins of the people. At the same time, he also want the woman to repent. So the way he uses, ask anyone, you don't have sin, then throw the first stone. And the people were, you know, they, they had guilt. They know that they have sinned, and so they all walked away. And then, but he said to the woman, 
do not sin anymore. And then uh, when Peter followed him for three years, when Peter was about to deny Jesus three times, Jesus told him that. But Jesus also said, I have prayed for you that you will not lose your faith. When you turn back, strengthen your brother. Now this is a very good example of confrontation. Jesus was confronting him, but Jesus was not saying, you Peter, you shame on yourself. You know, you, you follow me three years, you've seen all these miracles, you know I'm the Christ. I mean, how will you do something like that? You, you really should be punished or something like that. But Jesus did not do that. Or when Jesus spoke to Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, so many times I've tried to gather you, like a hen trying to gather the chicks, but then you did not obey. So, so Jesus, when he spoke to Jerusalem, he was still using love to draw them back to him. Now, of course, when he spoke to the Pharisees, he was really stern. The Bible does contain stern statements. There are times that we need to do that. But when people are following God, when they are believers, we really don't need to do that. The sternness is only for people who know to know God but don't repent. It's not for the outsiders either, because the outsiders don't know about God's law, uh, so they don't know how to follow God. So it doesn't mean you know someone outside that they've committed serious sin and then we just yell at them. Or Christians, because Christians they basically they are they want to do good, they want to follow God. If not, they won't be in the church, basically. But they are, of course, they are false Christians, but. Generally, they are, but they don't know how to do it. Many people don't know how to handle problems. For instance, even people, I'm not saying it's right to have adultery, but when people commit adultery, part of the reason is ignorance, because they don't know the seriousness of having lust. They don't know how serious it is, and they don't know how to handle the lust. Uh, in a way, I'm not saying it's right for them to have adultery. I'm saying, we can have compassion on them, and then we can help them. So for uh, children, it's according to the biblical way that we can see that. Jesus only spoke sternly to the Pharisees. Now in the Old Testament, the prophets spoke sternly too, many times. But you know, after some chapters of sternness, warnings, and then he would talk about the grace of God that you notice that. So it's, uh, it's always the grace of God to draw people to Him. So for me, I, I think that for teaching children, helping children, it's more the grace, you know, the words of grace. Today I talk about the words of grace. Oh, uh, the other day, yesterday, right? Today I talk about that to the, uh, the grace and words of the law. The words of grace will be like, oh, you're important. I love you. I care about you. You are important in the sight of God. You can become a great person. So those are words of grace. But we need the words, uh, words of the law too. Uh, that there are different ways of uh, classification. The first is exploring. Now you can write down if you don't have it. Exploring. That means trying to explore to find ways to resolve a problem. Exploring. The second is um, guiding. Someone knows it, and he wants to help the other person. Instead of teaching, he can guide. He can guide. And then, request. Request someone to do it. Please, take this garbage can for me. And then, command. And then, accuse. And then, condemnation. Now, all this we need to do sometimes. When a person doesn't repent repeatedly, I have to condemn. I have to accuse. But I can accuse in a gentle way. Being gentle doesn't mean it's not as strong. Some people think being loud is strong. Being loud is more powerful. It's not necessarily true. You can talk to a person very gently and yet you can say, do you realize what you have done? How it damaged your family and damaged someone else's family? Do you realize the consequence? What you've done and what do you think God 
think about that. That can be very serious. This is very heavy wording. But I'm, I don't use any, any wording that make them feel being debased, being looked down upon. But what I said is very seriously. It's, you know, I don't easily use that kind of wording. That's so accusation and condemnation. So, as I said, all these ways of communication of the law can be gentle or can be uh, harsh. The problem is, for most people, they think that the only way is being harsh. When someone is wrong, they, they will hold back. If someone has committed some sins, they hold back and they don't want to say it until finally they can hold it and then they have anger. Why did you do that? Did you know it's so serious? It happens in couples' relationship a lot. They think that holding back is good, but actually it's best to talk about it. As soon as some problem emerges, then start talking about it, but in a gentle way. So the concept that communication can be gentle and can be pinpoint at a problem, and can strengthen the person and let them know he is important. So first thing I would say to children, I would say, wow, you're a good boy, you're a good girl, you're important, God loves you and I care about you and I want to help you to become a great person. Do you want to be a great person like this person, that person? Do you like to be great like that? Do you think you have the potential? Look at your, your ability. Uh, do you think you have abilities that God has given you? I would talk to the children like that all the time. And to the people I'm with, I always tell them how this, what the strengths are and I appreciate what they do. And this is what God does. You know, He said, you would do greater things than I do. Now, what He meant, not better things. Jesus did not say better things. He said greater things. Because there are evangelists now who can reach more people than Jesus. But not better. But He can say to us, you can do greater things than I. I mean, that's, people would say, well, that's too much. I mean, how can we say we do greater things than Jesus? Of course, what Jesus does in heaven, no one can outdo him. But what did Jesus did on earth? There are some people who did greater things than what Jesus did. So, Jesus lift up people, tell people how important they are. That's, that's something we should have as a group that always, you know, the atmosphere, when you see someone that you say, I'm happy to see you, it's, it's, it's so good to see you grow in the Lord, it's so good to see you pray for the people, you care about the people, and I see God working in you, and I think it's very wonderful to let people know that, that's, that's, uh, that they are appreciated, that we truly, honestly, from the heart, appreciate them, that lifts up, the, the, to let them know they are treasure, and that's what God does to us too. That the Bible has so many word, words on you know, accepting us. That the, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That is so strong. The love of God sticking to us so strong. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So that's very strong language. And God rejoiced over us with singing. That's also very strong wording. So when we have this, do we apply to our lives? that talk to people like that. That's the first thing. And then, second thing, when someone has done wrong, a child has done wrong, what can we do? We can explore. The child disobeyed. And then you say, well, do you realize what you have done? Um, what do you think what you have done? Uh, what, how would it make your sister feel? How would it make your teacher feel? Uh, what, you know, what consequence, how it would affect you? And um, now when a child cannot talk and you just say, okay, give you multiple choice. <laughs> it will make him feel good. It will make him feel bad. It will hurt him. You know, what, what would it be? So help him communicate that. And also let them know, okay, now we have a friendly talk. And sometimes you can hold his hand, hold his shoulder, and let him know you are not, when we co confront someone, it doesn't have to be harsh that it can be very gentle. So what do you think about that? So the first thing, let him know what he has done, how it would affect the other person. And then, uh, do you think this is wrong? 
And then, according to the Bible, when you've done something wrong, what should you do? And then, you know, he might say, repent, ask Jesus to forgive. And then if he doesn't know, then you tell him, okay, this is what you do. But then what's next? How can you correct the situation? You have hurt someone, you have, you have yelled at someone. What can you do to guide? This is exploring, guiding. And actually, it's, it's guiding and exploring. Guiding. Uh, do you think you can say sorry to him? And he says, well, no, it's too hard. I don't want to say sorry. Uh, and then we guide him. That the Bible also talks about confess sins to one another. So uh, now that person, how do, how do you think he feels when you hit him? How do you think he feels? He feels unhappy. He feels unfair. So do you think you should do something uh, to, to him to, you know, to pay back what you've done? First you can say sorry. Next, maybe you buy a gift to him to tell him, I'm sorry I've done this to you and I want to give you this gift to tell you I'm sorry to you and also I want to say I care about you, I love you, I want a good relationship with you. So we can communicate like that and, and it doesn't have to hurt and it lifts up people and it doesn't, doesn't mean that then he would abuse the, this way of uh, confrontation. I don't think it's necessarily that way. Now some people think if I spend him so hard he will remember it. but at the same time he will have there will be a side effect of anger of resentment, frustration, rejection. And we don't need to do that. When Peter you know, about, was about to uh, deny Jesus, D Jesus did not do anything to punish him, but he tell him. And Jesus, before Jesus did anything, he prayed for him first. He already knew that he's going to deny, he was going to deny Jesus, and he prayed for him first. Okay? Now, if it's someone to confront here and then someone to confront outside are two different matters. I think for a serving team, we need to have principles of uh, a behavior, relationship with God, relationship with each other, relationship with ministry, relationship with ourselves that I will talk about later. That we should have principles that so um, for instance, no gossiping. Uh, anything among the leaders should not be spread to the people. And uh, if we're helping someone, we, we want to make the person feel good. So we don't want to tell the whole world that this person has committed that sin. We want to make this person, you know, not to feel too bad and then we want the person to repent. And also, uh, now for me, in my group, I have these this rules. Uh, if they find anything wrong with me, they can tell me. They, they have any suggestion, they can tell me. But I, I will say to them, I don't necessarily take your suggestion. I will consider it. I don't have to take all your suggestion. But you can tell me. And I can tell you too. But when I tell you, I won't hurt you. And my intention is to help you. I want to help each one to be a better person. So for anyone that's in the service team, I will tell them, I, when I see something, I will let you know. But before I tell them what they need to improve, I also tell them how good they are. So, so they know that. And, and they know that they can do the same to me. And I'm open to suggestions. And when people suggest to me, I will say thank you. Thank you for suggesting. And so there's an atmosphere in the group that they know that if something is wrong, it should be handled. And also there should be teaching that when one person sin, it can affect the whole group. That in the Bible, in uh, uh, James chapter 2, it talks about if a person breaks one commandment, he breaks all commandments. What does that mean? For instance, if someone doesn't like another person, that's breaking one commandment. But when he breaks that commandment, he would have resentment. He would, he would lose his peace. He would find it hard to pray to God. If every time he comes to church, he doesn't like to see the person, he will have a problem praying. 
he will have problems serving. And this frustration will follow him everywhere he goes. So it hurt his whole person, hurt his relationship with God, with people, with himself. So any, any sin, anger, adultery, it would really hurt the person totally, the whole person and his family and the church. And anger in the church too also hurt the church because if one person is angry with another person, sooner or later people will notice that, right? They will notice that and they will say, oh, this person is angry with the person and we try to resolve it, it doesn't work and it, it hurts the whole body. The whole body, body feels there's no more joy, there's burden. So there should be rules in the group that how we handle problems and problems can be very damaging and it also take away our reward. When we are building on the foundation of Jesus and when we sin, then we are building up and tearing down. I mean, do, does anyone build a house like that? He built a few bricks and then he tear it down. Builds a few bricks and tear it down. It, 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 you never build up the house. But many people serve God like that. Many people serve God at the same time as pride or other things. And the pastor told me an instance of someone who, um, who told his member, when I throw my jacket at you, you fall down and I'll give you some money. <laughs> that you, you show how much anointing there is. What is the point, you know? Are we to impress people or are we to serve God? It's not, I mean, for someone, something like that, if I know this person, I would go to him. I would go to him as a brother and say, I love you, I care about you, and you have great potential. And uh, I heard this about you, and I, I want to, you know, I want to know if this is true. Tell me, what is the truth? And then I would, you know, because it's something that will hurt the whole body of Christ. Not just his church, but, you know, other churches too. It will hurt the reputation. So, um, when I know something like that, I would, I would confront. So what I mean is, people should realize the consequence of sin and then we can handle it. And when people understand how good God is, how good is God's plan for us, and how damaging our sins. Sins are all damaging. But many people commit sins and they think, it's okay for now, I ask Jesus to forgive later. And sometimes people think, you know, there are sins that, you know, like stealing, those things, those sins I won't commit. Adultery, those are serious, I won't commit. But anger, a lot of people would hold anger. They think, they think, well, this is natural. Well, my husband or wife is not nice to me. It's natural to be angry. But it's, it's damaging. It's, we're building up, but it's tearing down. So when people understand these concepts from the Bible, that any kind of sin is damaging, then it also gives a foothold to the devil. Then we'll say, yes, Lord, I want to face this sin. So the key to face sin, God gave me a very simple way. When it appears in the mind, immediately I realize it's present and I know it's destructive. Whenever I have any negative thoughts, it's destructive. Immediately I will apply, you know, God gave me a five step to victory. First, aware. Aware of the problem. Second, destructive. It is destructive. Third, biblical concept. Apply biblical concept to. So what does the Bible say I should do? Four, pray. Of strength. Five, choose to obey. So, aware, destructive, biblical concept, pray, choose to obey. And then, if you simplify, it's one, four, five. Three steps to victory. Aware, pray, choose. Because if you already know sins are destructive, and you know the biblical principles, then you aware, oh, I have some anger some negative feeling toward my spouse. Immediately we are aware and then we pray and then we say yes. Even though I don't feel like it because the person is not nice to me, but I choose to say, God bless you. I want to build up the relationship. And I, if someone says something unpleasant to us, we can still say, for instance, the person says, go do it. 
we feel unhappy, but we say, okay, thank you for reminding me, I'll do it. So instead of being angry, I want to say it in a gentle way. Now, many people say, that's unfair. He talks in such a rough way, why should I answer him in such a gentle way? That makes him feel he's more powerful. But actually, the Bible says, the one who conquers his heart is stronger than one who conquers a city. So we are conquerors if we can talk to people in such a gentle way. Mm. Many people believe the lies and say, be angry and then you're the winner. So all team members should realize sins are serious. Any kind of sin, any gossiping or negative feeling. Now if someone is not doing well in some way, whether it's the leader or the members, there is no reason to be angry with the person. We just want to find a solution. We want to pray for the person and find a solution. But you say, oh, that's too hard. It's so perfect. I cannot be so perfect. Um, but when we realize the, me the method, the way, the biblical way is to not to hurt, but to love and care and to help the person that way, that way, that's the biblical principle. It, it will hurt the feelings. And it's possible to restore the person back and keep him in a church, keep him serving God. So when we have this concept, then it won't hurt the relationship. And then what we do will not give the devil a foothold. Now for myself, I'm very careful when I do all these things because I go to different countries, I go to different pastors, I handle all these pastors and I sometimes have to do suggestions to the pastors and I want to do it in a way that the pastors don't feel looked down upon. I want to do it in a way that I respect them, honor them, that they are important. That I'm careful to how to handle situation, handle people. If I make any one single mistake, the word can spread and say, don't invite Pastor you because he's too rough on people. You know, so I have to be very careful to restore what what God has given me. So, so here too, you're building on your foundation. So when you're helping someone, then you want to have, uh, you want to be building on it. Even though when you're helping someone to repent, you're still building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We don't want to hurt people. Okay, so first we want to pray to God for wisdom. Sometimes in some difficult situation, now the Bible does say approach a person by yourself first. Uh, but you can ask the pastor for advice. How can I handle this well? Because he has many experiences, he has handled many cases. So you, you can ask him, what is the best way? Because sometimes we might miss some points. He might have some good suggestion. It, it is good that you two handle it instead of having the pastor handle it in the first step. The reason is, if someone offends you and you know someone has committed some sin and then you tell the pastor and then the pastor handle it together the person will say why didn't you tell me why do you have to bring the pastor and make it so serious so big so it can hurt the relationship so the best is that we handle it but if you don't know how to handle it well ask the pastor and you pray to God how can I do it how can I do it in a, in a gentle way um, now for each case is different. Basically, if you want to handle someone's problem, don't handle it the first instance. You have to think carefully and to find the right time. But you have to face it sooner or later. But when is wisdom? Let me tell you two cases that I handle some people's problem. Those people are not my members. One case, I knew someone in a country on the internet, and this person we have talked for a couple of years, so I trust him. And then he arranged for me to go to that place. And then, uh, so I asked him when I you know, bought the plane ticket, and I asked him, after I get off the plane, when I get out, he said, take the train. So I said, do I stay on the same side of the airport or go to the opposite side? to get to the bus to go to the train and uh, and then he was unhappy 
why did you ask all these questions? Now, he, he, it was he who asked me to come. Well, I know I detect something not right. But I did not get angry. I did not ask him why, because that might not be the right time. I tell him the reason why. Because I'll be dragging the luggage. If it's on the same side, look for the bus stop. Then I just take the luggage to the same side and look for the bus stop. If it's on the opposite side, then I go to the opposite side. But if I don't know which side, I go to this side and look, and then go across and then come back, then I'll be taking a luggage. So that's why I want to ask. Now, I, I remember this, but I don't handle it right away. And then I went there to preach and teach, and then, and then when I left, he took me to, the, uh, to take the bus back. And then he said to me, Pastor Yip, the moment you start talking, speaking, immediately I see the anointing, you know, the power of God. I thank God for that. It's not me, it's God. And he said that to me. And I said, thank God. I, I said to him, thank God. It's not from me, it's from God. And then I realized he was ready that I can confront him. Now, sometimes we cannot wait for that moment for some people, but for this person, that time was ready. So I asked him, I want to talk to you about something. Is it okay? He said, yes, it's okay. I said, on a day when I talk to you about coming here, and I asked you whether I stay on the same side of the airport or walk across the street, and then you were unhappy. I used a lighter word. I don't use, I don't use a stronger word, not to offend him. <laughs> and then I'd like to know why. He said, when people ask me many questions, I get angry. Then I asked him, well, <coughs> does it affect you? Does that problem affect you? So he, he, he talked to me. And then he said, since my childhood, I have been like that. Whenever people ask me a lot of things or say a lot of things to me, I get frustrated. So I asked him, that, does that affect you? You want to serve God, does that affect you? And uh, he realized that. And then I, I guide him to, you know, to, to how to handle that in the future when that happens. So I found the right moment to confront him. If I just confront him, when I talk to him on the phone, he might say, I'm not going to talk to you, don't come. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he might not be ready or unhappy. So I have to have the attitude that, yes, guiding someone to change can be done in a gentle way and in the right time when a person is ready. Unless if the person is now chasing women and then having sex with them, that's something I have to stop right away. If it's not something like that, it has been happening for a while, it's not going to break down the world, I wait for the right moment. So it, it depends. So sometimes you seek advice and see what is the right time to do it. Um, so, uh, and then we have to also think. Now the best is, if you and your spouse have the wisdom and the, the ability to hold secrets. Now it's very, actually, as husband and wife together, we should be able to hold secrets that we, we can talk to each other about how to handle situations. That if your spouse is mature, if he's not, he or she is not, then don't do it. My wife is very mature. That when situation like that, I will talk to her. I will ask her advice. Sometimes I have to confront people on WhatsApp. I will send it to her first. And then she will read it. And then she will tell me, what you say here, you know, is not necessary. You don't have to say it like that. You can say it in a different way. And she really gives me good suggestion. He would not say, well, how can you say something like that? <laughs> she did not, did not say it like that. But she said, well, that can be another way to say it. Or is it necessary to say that? So if you have someone to give you advice, because Confrontation is difficult. The point is, you believe that first you raise up the people's you know, uh, feeling about himself, that he's important, and uh, you have general guidance, principle in the group that these are the ways that we follow. Uh, and then you, f you pray for the person to pray for the right, the right way to handle it, the right time to handle it, and then you also look at the, pe the person's response. When you talk to the person, first, you really want to, you want to have a good atmosphere. 
that you know, if you start talking and if I say, ah, 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 <laughs> he's not going to change. He's going to oppose you all the way. And, and we don't want that relationship either. And so, what is the wisdom? The wisdom to say it like, from his perspective is the best wisdom. You are very special person. You have many spiritual gifts. You can do great things for God. And what I'm saying is something that will help you more. Do you want me to talk about it? And, uh, and, then, and then you can say, well, I've noticed this, that you said that on the other occasion. Uh, you have a certain behavior on that occasion. Uh, do you think that will hinder your ministry? Do you think it will affect you? And, and let him talk. And in the process, listening is very important. Instead of saying he must be wrong, sometimes he might be misunderstood. Sometimes uh, he might have his own reason or his lies. Sometimes people have lies they didn't realize. For instance, the lie that you have to be angry to overcome someone, you know, to win someone. So he might have lies like that, or he might be affected by some other people, whatever it is, or maybe affected by his wife, and then so he behaved like that. So we listen and and empathize. We don't empathize with the sin. We empathize with his ability to overcome his sin. And we say, and it's difficult in a situation. I know you want to overcome that sin. And how, what do you think is a good way to overcome that? Now you notice this kind of way of talking, exploring, guiding someone is, is very, very gentle and make people think. And it, it doesn't, you know, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt the relationship first. But still some people, there are some people who won't listen to this kind of advice. Any advice they won't take. Then sometimes, some people, they have to be out of the ministry group. Sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm sad to say that I have handled a person like that. I have sent so many messages, always saying you're important, you can do great things, and I see many of spiritual gifts, uh, but this certain thing needs to be handled and but he she just denied and and uh, and so I could not change her uh, and I, I talked with my wife and we both of us talked with her together and we still could not resolve the situation and finally she herself left but when someone like that is very difficult it's it's difficult to handle okay so uh, we learned Confrontation, first by confronting your child. If you can confront your child in a gentle way, or confront your husband and wife without hurting the relationship, then you, then you, then because it's higher skill to confront someone who don't have that close relationship with you. But at the same time, confronting husband and wife can be very difficult because the relationship has been like that for a long time. It's very hard because there has been some lies in the relationship and a lot of negative feelings hidden. So that's why a uh, husband and wife relationship is very difficult. And tomorrow afternoon, I'll talk about that. Okay, what I talk about that the words of grace and words of the law can be used anywhere. Uh, because anywhere in a place of work, we can still talk to people and say, wow, you're doing a good job. Thank you for helping me. You're doing great, you know, things like that we can always say to people. You're talented, you, you work fast. I like you, I admire you, you know. And, but sometimes we still have to talk about the law, uh, things you need to do. And the best, the best is exploring and guiding. That's the best way. And uh, sometimes, you know, certainly at the place of work we need to request sometimes, you know, please do this. And then, uh, and then command, we still have to do it. I mean, command can be soft and, and, and strong. Com soft will be like, uh, please do this for me. Please help me. And then, uh, uh, I think anytime we should not use strong language. You know, actually any of this should not use strong language. 
Now, in what place do we have to accuse and con you know, confront people? We do have to. We do have to. Actually, I think we should add confront there. Confront and then accuse. Confront. Uh, we do need to confront. Uh, for instance, a coworker has missed his job, you know, a number of times. Then we'll ask him, uh, uh, do you know what happened just now? Uh, why wasn't it done? Uh, what happened? Uh, and then when a person, now we, we need to have trust for the person too. Uh, we ask the person, uh, why is it not done? And then he says, well, uh, the bus was late. <laughs> Uh, uh, the car was, you know, the road was jammed. Okay, we accept him the first time. And, but with time, we notice, observe the person, we find that person's lying. Then we can confront the lying. But if no reason to, you know, to distrust him, then we should not distrust him when he says that it's the bus, you know, whatever it is. Then what can we do next time? So, so but certain time we have to accuse. But of course, in the workplace, there's a hierarchy. You can never do that to your boss. <laughs> That's a fact of life that you cannot go to work and then you, you can say, boss, why, why did you do something like that? You know, we cannot <laughs> confront the boss. We can explore. We can say, boss, uh, we have this problem. How can we handle it? So that's so something unfair. So it's something we, we, we can use anywhere. And if we are aware, when we talk with people, we are aware what I'm using and what tone of voice I'm using and what tone of voice the other person is using. Now, if the person is frustrated, then you know it's not the right time to talk. You can wait. You know, it's not, the whole world is not going to crumble if we don't handle it right away. Some problem, if the person is very unhappy and angry, it's not the right time to handle it. Now, I want to talk about also confrontation of members. Um, now, some people say, some leaders may say, never confront members. If you confront members, they will lose. You lose them. Now, that is a false saying. Mm. But at the same time, I want to say this. We discern whether something needs to be confronted. You can basically go to every single person, you can find some faults. If, you, if in a church you go to every single person and find a fault and confront them, I'm telling you, you won't have many members left. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the responsibility to confront every single person on every single problem he has. I mean, that's not our responsibility. Jesus did not confront all his disciples about everything, you know. He confronted the most important ones. And... Um, but then there are issues that are damaging to the church. Uh, sexual problem, pride, strong language, you know, things like that, that we need to confront. Now some people will say, well, if we confront, we'll lose the member. But I'll tell you, if we, we don't confront, we'll lose more members. <laughs> because that person could hurt more people. So don't think that you confront will make them go away. And, and you lose people. And also, when a church, now it's very important, we're not pursuing just a holy church. We, want, we don't want to pursue a loving church. That is pursuing holiness, the two together. And which one is the main, main uh, characteristic of a church? The first issue, first thing that shows should be love. You know, for God too, the first thing about Him is love. Yes. And then is holiness. We want to have a loving church and then a holy church. The problem is, seldom do you find a loving church and a holy church. And so we have to discern how much we confront. And for some people, it's better to build them up to help them overcome problems instead of confronting them. Instead of saying, uh, you always talk loudly. We can say, well, this is how we can talk. <laughs> and demonstrate that. And uh, uh, instead of saying, why are you so shy? We can say, well, we can be more courageous. We can try to say what you 
have in your mind, you know, whatever it is, simple things we can talk about. So it's better to say positive things or sometimes do it through teaching, general teaching, so that everyone hear it. And I think it's very important that to build up in a church that the people all love the Lord and love the church and love each other and really want to bless each other. That way the church will grow, will be strong. So it doesn't mean we don't confront them, but then we want to see which issue is more important too.